All right, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, good to see everyone out here tonight. Thanks for coming out on Monday night. Uh, we'll probably get some more people coming into the door. Uh, we're not known to be punctual people as game developers, but uh, well, you're starting early. Goodness gracious! It's ten minutes early. Anyway, I won't take ten minutes to introduce our, our, our panel, but uh, we have a panel of two this evening, and really the whole idea is. We get two people who have interesting opinions that potentially could just play off each other. You don't really need a moderator. So we'll have some uh, questions to take afterwards. But uh, in any case, at this point, we have Adam Creighton, uh, General Manager from Panic Button Games. And we have Gordon Walton, co-founder of Artcraft Entertainment, just coming off a successful Kickstarter campaign. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. They should still donate it. No. <laughs> Support Gordon. It's fantastic. Hey, so Gordon, um, some people know who you are. A lot of people do. A lot don't. Why don't you kind of give a quick 30-second uh, summary of, of your background and why they should listen to you right now? 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, or a minute, 30 or two minutes. Until. Really old game guy. Failed on more game projects than more, most people have ever done. What else? Oh, I guess that's rather. <laughs> and just coming off of uh, the uh, new uh, uh, Kickstarter. Yep. Yeah, so that's going well. Um, and then you've been behind a bunch of, of uh, powerhouse products like uh, Bioware, Knights of the Old Republic, um, Sony Online, uh, Star Wars. Yeah, people think I have an honest face. <laughs> right. They could be wrong. <laughs> cool. Uh, and then I'm Adam Creighton. I'm the GM, co-owner, and uh, director of development for Panic Button here in Austin. And we're an independent studio. And so we have a couple of independent studio uh, devs here with uh, histories and, probably more importantly, strong opinions. Uh, John joked that we don't need a moderator. I think uh, with Gordon and I, a moderator, it would go badly for the moderator. So this is probably better that we just talk to each other. Yeah. So Gordon, uh, as you went through this Kickstarter recently, what, uh, what surprised you as you were going through the process? You've been making games for a long time. You've been raising money for a long time. Doing it by way of a Kickstarter is a new thing for you. So what surprised you as you went through the process? Well, I think a lot of things surprised me. Uh, the biggest thing was, even though we thought we were really well prepared, you know, the events overtake you. So, you know, it's a uh, live performance, is basically what a Kickstarter is. And that means no matter how good your plan, it's not going to survive. And you're going to have to go, oh, well, we thought that was going to work great. It worked like crap. We have to bring something else forward right now because, you know, people are not entertained. So we must entertain them. So we did a lot of ad-libbing uh, along the way, and our content release schedule for the Kickstarter got accelerated, which meant we were like running on empty toward the end, which was very challenging. Um, so I, I think it was, and we felt like we really did a good job getting ready. Right. Like we really thought we understood what we were doing. We studied everybody who been successful. We studied a lot of people who have been unsuccessful. To try to figure out, okay, what are the metal lessons? What do we need to know? And I can't think of a day when I didn't get surprised by something in the 30 days. So really, though, you know, Kickstarter is, you know, it's, it's 30 days, right? So you launch the Kickstarter, you sit back, you watch the money roll in, and then you end it. Yeah, yeah, days, that's right? what you do. You just watch the money roll. <laughs> so what, is, what, is the, what does the timeline look like then? So there's the prep before the, the Kickstarter, there's the Kickstarter itself, and then you stop working after the Kickstarter, right? Well, the, after the Kickstarter, you're typically exhausted because it is about a 20-hour day thing. It's like an MMO launch is what it felt like, like a big MMO launch. So, you know, never-ending could consume every hour of your day and more if you, if you let it. So, yeah, it was very, it was very intense, extremely intense. I would not advise going into one unless you're ready for that level of intensity. And then you, you know, you're going to get a tiny bit of recovery. And then you actually have to build the product all the rest of the way, which is, you know, a big deal too. So, what does your uh, every day look like now since the Kickstarter? And and how is it different because of the Kickstarter, right? Because you're making the game, and you've done that before. Yeah. So now you've got the crowdfunding element on top of it. Uh, so how is that different? Well, I think mostly right now we're still in that place where we're putting it all together. You know, we, we had a plan for what we wanted to do after Kickstarter, and get the plan together, make sure that everybody else is on that same sheet of music, right? So you have a group of people, and you're trying to keep them all coordinated and running in the same direction, 
you're adding some new people to the team, you're having some people leave the team. It's, you know, the typical shuffle as you move from one phase of development to another. So we're moving out of kind of pre-production into an early production state, even though it's still alpha, you know, very alpha. And so you've been doing this for a while, so what's, what, what's different or what stayed the same in game development? What's getting in the way of getting games done and what's something that's still get games done? Well, I think that it's, you know, it's always been hard to make games. It's never been easy to make games, whether you're making them by yourself or with two people or with five people or with 500 people. You know, the scale makes it worse. You know, the more people involved, the more things are going to go wrong. That's, that's just natural. Um, but I think that the challenges have always been the same, too. We're trying to predict the future. We're trying to look into the future and say, we'll be finished in, with development in X time, whether it's two months or two years or seven years, and say, we're going to have something that everybody wants to play then, when you have no idea, really, what that landscape is going to look like. So you're predicting the future on that. You're predicting the future on what hardware you're going to be on. You're predicting the future of business models. And when things move slower, it could be a better predictor. And now things move really, really fast. So nobody's a good predictor. One of the things I enjoyed learning while I was at Platum is Platum took all the best designers that they had, all of them, and they would have them guess about what would be the thing that would cause, you know, cause the least drop-off rate, you know, create the most money and free-to-play games. And the very best designers if you were the best of the best designer, you could be right almost 40% of the time. And everybody else was tremendously worse than that. So you couldn't even get a 50-50, you know, rightness to anything you were doing with the best people. Because that's how chaotic the whole thing is. So I think that we're that, we live in that world. We live in a highly chaotic, highly iterative, highly feedback-intensive world when you make games. Right, and I think it's one of the things for me that's been challenging and exciting at the same time because we tend to crow a lot about games being that intersection of uh, entertainment like movies and software development like enterprise and how we kind of do the best of both. For me, I have a bias that says we're actually 12 years behind the rest of both of those industries in almost every way. Uh, and so one of my irritations is, you know, put that on its head, it, 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 it's harder because we're doing both of those things. Um, I look at it, and we're, we're trying to do that inter intersection of uh, engineering and computer science and art and entertainment. Uh, and that's a very hard thing to do, to take, take that creative vision and move it to pixels on a screen. It's kind of, uh, one, if you think about it too much, it's crazy, and you might stop doing it. Uh, the other part of it is, um, you run into this, people think that we make games, so therefore we play games all the time, and that's how we're, we're making games. Yeah, but you know, people, you know, people obviously think that chefs, all they do is eat. You know, and some of them look like it, but, you know, we're, 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 truthfully, you know, eating is not cooking, right? Making games is not playing games. It's the same thing. And, you know, I, I, when I think about, when I first met you and you said, hey, I want to get into games with us, uh, you know, and I, I think I blessed you and, you know, wished you well. And I'm pretty sure I kissed your ring. I'm pretty sure. Uh, well, I'm not sure that had anything to do with what happened to you. I think I was, did, did I tell you that you were nuts for doing that? Yeah, you did. I probably do that because I tell that to everybody. I was glad you did. Yeah, but it didn't stop you. No, I'm uh, bullheaded that way. Yeah, Gordon was actually a big part of how I got into games. Because getting into games from enterprise software, I was worldwide uh, one of the worldwide tech directors for Visa for years. Uh, so I was doing the enterprise side of things, uh, running multiple projects, and wanted to get into games. Originally, I was pitching ideas for payment companies for how to make money in games. Uh, and actually got, hey, there's no money in video games. And uh, after uh, three years of that not going anywhere, I built a three-year plan to get into the game industry. Now, I didn't start there. I actually tried to get into the game industry. Which is the other problem with the game industry. It's very, uh, not, I'll say, it's insular. Uh, it, it's very closed. It's very hard to get into the game industry uh, unless you know people. And people like Gordon were great because, one, they said, you don't want to do this unless you really want to do this. And two, he said, you got to build a plan. So uh, he and some other people both all gave me independent advice that was the same thing, which was make sure you want to get into this, make sure you want to start over, make sure you want to deal with this kind of pain, and here's some steps for things you can do to get into the industry. It's tremendously helpful for me. So thank you, Gordon. Oh, well, you know, I was searching for a masochist and I found <laughs> So many in the game industry. <laughs> no, it's, it's serious. You know, the, it is a challenging medium. And the, and the real challenge is there's no coasting. Right. There's no plateau. Right. There, you can't say, I made it in the games business and sit still. 
You can't do it because the game's business is moving. You're either moving with it or you're getting left behind. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, the games industry, like just a lot of entertainment industries, it's the flavor of the month kind of thing. And honestly, the game industry is not unique to the game industry, but you know, a lot of industries have the. It's not what you've done; it's what you last did. So what you last did has to be quality because nobody remembers. Uh, and this industry is kind of bad about that. There's you know, there's the quote unquote game gods, right? There are just legions of amazing people like Gordon Walton and Craig Galley and, and uh, Chuck Looper and all these people who've been in the industry for you know 30 plus years making games. And people don't know about them. That's because they're busy making games uh, and successfully bringing people along with them that want to do the same thing. And you know that's one of the things that I always encourage people to, to really think about as they're getting in the game industry. What, what do you want? There are so many designers that I'll interview and turn down because they, they, they want to be the creative director and they, they'll name certain people that they want to be in the limelight. Uh, and you don't want to work with any of those people. I don't want to work with any of those people. Exactly. I really don't want to work with any of those people. <laughs> I, mean, I want people who, who want to do something special, do something hard, uh, and are willing to do the work for it. And the work is, yeah, it's not easy. There are days where I'm like, man, I don't want to do this work anymore. Um, but it's important to do, and that's how you get good product out there, I think, at the end of the day. Yep. This is the challenge, right? I think that so many people think creative industries are super awesome, but you know, creative industry is so. If your average job has two percent creativity, the game job has four, maybe five on a good day. That means ninety-five, ninety-six percent of the time, it's just elbow grease. It's actual work. It's stuff you don't want to do mostly. Right? right. Yeah, I do a lot <laughs> but of But needs doing. It's stuff that needs doing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm working on one right now. That I don't want to do. Yeah, and it's it's it, and it's you know taking care of everybody, right? Everybody's got different skills and bringing those to the table, but that doesn't mean that everybody gets to do just what they want to do. Um, you know, the difference between a professional and uh, one who's not is not just that you get paid for your work; it's that you do the work, even if it's not work you want to do. At our studio, uh, Panic Button hires a lot of multipliers, and we do a lot of context switching. And you know, one of the things I do to weed out people when I'm interviewing is I, I talk to them about very specific scenarios where they have to switch contexts within a project or between projects. And those people who complain about that don't last very long uh, in the interview. Not in a mean-spirited kind of way, but it's really feeling out, look, we're doing something special. We work on multiple projects. Uh, I do projects a little differently as far as full-time equivalents, and I'm very upfront with my clients about that so that they get access to the entire studio. That means everybody has to switch gears multiple times and everybody has to deliver. And that people have to be able to deliver on the stuff that they don't want to do necessarily. Now, I treat that really seriously. So I make sure I also get work that people do want to do um, to make sure that I take care of them in a, in a level that's kind of at a core level below just you know having work and having interesting work to do. How do you deal with that when you're dealing with people who are working on things they want to work on versus what they don't? Well, I think that you know you're you're searching for people to fit a culture right, that you've set up, and if somebody right. won't do those things, they're not going to be a cultural fit. They're not going to be happy. They're going to be you know. A bad apple in a barrel messing up a bunch of your other apples. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, it's difficult to find the people you're looking for because a lot of people want to just put their head down and get their work done. They don't like context switching. Context switching is expensive. It is. Emotionally, it's expensive, you know, kind of mentally, period. You know, it's very challenging. Um, I think that, like you, I interview people. I want to understand who they are as a human. As much, you know, the ante is that you can do the job and that you're talented and that you'll work on it, right? That's an ante. That everybody has to have that or they don't even get there to start with. But then I'm looking for who they are really. How are they going to react to the stress? You know, what, what's their coping mechanism when things go wrong? You know, how they handled some, some of the really adverse stuff in life when it's hit them. Because, you know, making games means we're going to have adverse stuff happen. That's the... Shit happens in making games. Yeah. Shit happens to us, typically, when making games. Well, especially when we're working in such a creative discipline with so many moving parts outside of our control. You know, especially when you're a small independent studio or a lot of our uh, portfolio is work for hire. You know, we're kind of at the whim of people outside of ourselves. And so we spend a lot of time uh, crazy things to create. People who are not... There's, man, there's, a, there's, a, there's someone I will not name uh, that got into to power. He, he's a big advocate of, of mine, of uh, Panic Button. We had some other people from the company call us and say, hey, you know, so-and-so's in charge. And I, I said, you realize so-and-so's crazy? And they're like, yeah, but he's crazy and he likes you and he's in charge. So you have to weigh those things. It's a little scary sometimes. 
Um, but you know, when, when you're doing things like work for hire, or, or you're doing your self-funded, independently funded project, and you have inve external investors or crowdfunding investors, there there are voices outside of yourself that you're beholden to, and that that's challenging, right? Because you have to be honest, you've got to be transparent. Uh, you can't be too transparent uh, because there's just being diplomatic but not being political, and that's an important distinction. I hate politics. Hate politics. You should all know that about me. Hate it. I just call uh, it never give them a stick to beat you with. There's that too. Yes. Don't give yeah. I don't want to get poked in the eye with the thing I gave them. Uh, and and I, I plan things so if things go sideways outside of my control, I plan enough internally that we can adapt. Uh, we have as a as a working policy, we have a no crunch policy. In the four years I've been running it, we've been able to do that. And you know, knock on wood, that's you know, by the grace of God, and I'm gonna keep trying to do that. That doesn't mean we don't work hard. We work really hard because we care. And it doesn't mean we don't occasionally do a late night or a weekend. But we don't crunch, which is awesome. Uh, and we work on some great, great properties, and we're really proud of that. But that requires everybody on board to be on board. And we have to push back on, on people who are like, you know what, I just want to do the, you know, the minimal. Like we just, that doesn't fit with our particular culture. Uh, well, it doesn't fit with the game business. Yeah, well, that's right. Literally, yeah. if you're in the game business to have a job, you're in the wrong damn business. Right. You know, if you care about what you, you know, the reason people are in the game business is to care about what they work on. Right. So you should only be working about on stuff you care about. You should only be doing that if you're making an emotional investment in it on top of the time. So if, if you, literally the clock punchers in the game industry make me crazy. Yeah. You're taking up a slot for somebody who actually cares. Yeah, and then I think I think the onus then is on us when we find those people who are passionate not to take advantage of them, right? Because you probably got lots of stories of, of working with different companies where it, it, some companies will take advantage of the, the passionate, on fire, free intern or entry level person. It's, it's or cultural. Yeah, and it's yeah. and it's something we got to change, quite honestly. And, and it's it's something that's that uh, I, I consider it a usury model. I don't think people should do that. Uh, we fight against it, you know, at, at kind of a, a micro level with our studio to make sure that we're not doing that. And I think that's how the industry changes over time, quite honestly. Um, but, I, you know, I agree with you, because the reality of it is, is um, we're doing what we do because we care about it. People can be, they can be money-oriented, they can be lifestyle-oriented, they can be passion-oriented. Same with companies. Companies can be lifestyle companies where they want to do the minimal, be comfortable. They can be money companies where they'll do whatever it takes uh, to make money at the expense of everything else. Uh, and they can be aspirational or innovative. And those are kind of your three types of companies, your three types of people. And finding that intersection is challenging. It's, I mean, it's, it's hard to find that kind of person. It's kind of easier to find the people who want to punch clocks. Oh, yeah. How many people here have worked in the game business and then worked outside of the game business after working in the game business? All right, so almost without exception, and there are a few industries that are pretty exciting, like ours, but there aren't that many. And almost without exception, when you do that, you go to another place and you go, wow, this place is slow. This place is filled with morons. This place has a whole bunch of people who don't care about what they're doing, and I'm, and I'm out of touch because I actually care about what I'm doing. Or worse than that, you're sold that and actually don't care about what you're doing at the new place. But, I mean, it, the pacing, the bright people that care about what they're doing, change your attitude toward work. And it's very difficult to work outside the game industry once you work in the game industry because it's addictive. That culture, that you know, that surrounding is addictive to most people. Until they, unless they get burned out completely, right? We do right, right. we do run people off of the game business all the time because they get a bad work situation. Yeah, and then that's one of the challenging parts of it is, is trying to get people to um, you want to hold on to that differentiation of the game industry, what that gives you, making games. Uh, versus um, people get put through the ringer and being done. There are a lot of people that I've worked with at different companies, and their first job was just you know, 18 months of hell. And then they left the game industry. And it makes me sad that, that was their exposure to the game industry. Now, go back to what I said earlier as far as the, the game industry being kind of uh, insular. You know, it's, it's funny, um, coming into the game industry, uh, it, was, it was way less stressed than what I was used to um, working at a payments company. Because we were working on a thing where we were working on uh, money. Yeah, exactly. You cannot mess up money. Uh, so we're working on we're working on the biggest back end system you know, in in the world, the fastest back end system, uh, mainframes, big iron IP, uh, and and programming at bare metal. And we're doing things, you know, running you know fourteen point eight trillion dollars of revenue through the systems uh, on a yearly basis. If if something goes wrong with the system, the gross national product of the U.S. falls in two hours, with the rest of the country falling afterwards. Those were high stakes. 
And so people work ridiculously hard and were passionate and amazing and things like that. So when I was looking at going into the game industry, I'm looking at the game industry, I'm looking at other industries, and I'm realizing that there's a, there's, you got to find those pockets of innovation and excitement and passion, whether it's inside or outside of the game industry. There, there are game companies I've talked to that are they're more lifestyle type companies. They're, they're more that kind of what it takes to do 9 to 5. There's, there's a few of them out there. They're also, for me at least, they're not doing as exciting stuff as, as what we're doing. Uh, you know, it's fun for us to bounce from... You know, Disney Infinity to to Octodad to Justice Gods Among Us to you know next gen hardware that hasn't been announced yet. Those are fun things to be working on uh, as we do work as an independent studio, and we all take it seriously. So we bounce around those things uh, pretty excitedly and pretty focused wise uh, because we don't want to mess those things up. We want those to be amazing for ourselves and for other people. <coughs> yep. So what are what are some of the challenges you have uh, as you, know, you win people out? You, you get an idea of who they are as a person. Uh, does it ever go badly for you? Sure. So give me an example. Game board <laughs> so, so has it ever... So game board involved, something's going to get screwed up. Has, 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 has anybody ever gotten mad at you for... Oh, uh, no, I've made people mad. I'm sure. I don't know why, but I'm sure I've made some people mad. Um, well, I mean, most people don't like being told anything straight up. Right. They don't like, you know, being told, you know, here's exactly what I think. Because when I tell people exactly what I think, typically... You know, unless I'm really, uh, really excited about them, they're not going to want to hear it. Right. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of like... Um, and it's uh, not that it's about them, it's typically about behavior. Right. It's about right. behavior or an action or, you know, something where I'm going, okay, I love you, but I hate your actions. Right. <laughs> That's actually important. Together. That's an important distinction, right? I mean, it's the... You know, it's easy to take things personally when you do or, or don't get a job. Like, I mean, you don't get a job, you can mistake that as, as a reflection of, of your self-worth. It's not. Uh, but same thing if you get a job, it's not necessarily a reflection of your self worth. Honestly, I have this bias. This means you interview really. Yeah, it's that, right? Or, or the, and, and for me also, there's the, you know, people have value because they are who they are, right? And what we do is a reflection of that value. So if I, if I say someone's on a match, for me, it's not a rejection of the person. We hire, we, we interview for core skills and for aptitude and for teachability and some other things, right? If you have somebody who's got basic skills, well, let's get rid of, they don't have basic skills. All right, then we look at whether they've got aptitude and teachability. Uh, you know, aptitude is that ability to, to grow on the skills they have, and teachability is the willingness uh, to grow with the skills they have. We have interviewed people who have got solid core skills and have got great aptitude uh, to be a rock star and have no teachability whatsoever. And we have a very frank conversation about that. Uh, and as it goes into argumentative mode, it becomes very clear where the problems in teachability are. Um, that doesn't mean we're always going to get it right when I'm interviewing people or other people are interviewing, but it's not fun. To Gordon's point, one of my big things is accountability, and it's more than just a word. Accountability is so, 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 so important, and accountability sucks. It's because accountability is painful. It peels back layers of, of things that I have to work on. Uh, and I ask people to hold me accountable on stuff. And I, I spend a lot, a lot of time surrounding myself by people who are going to tell me what I'm screwing up and how to make it better. Because their interest in me is me being a better person as opposed to showing what they know or how they're doing something better. Um, but that's part of our interview process. Uh, that can make people very uncomfortable when I talk about, you know, this is what you're going to have to do, this is how you're going to switch context, this is how you're saying, yes, I want to do all those things, and this is how you know, we're going to have a different conversation if we find out any of that's not working out. And we're going to equip you so it does, and if it doesn't, then we have a different conversation. Yeah, I think that, you know, people, you know, you can either live down to, up to or live up to your expectations. So, you know, you have to set your expectations correctly for people. Right. To where, you know, you always should be setting them to where they can live up to them. And in fact, if once you've decided somebody is the GOAT on the team, it's better to have them go right away rather yeah. than to wait, you know, because this is a very human activity too. On right. any group of people, if we put like 20 people together, within about five minutes, somebody would be the leader. Within three days, somebody would be the GOAT. The person who you go, okay, that's the loser on the team. And here's what's bad. Here, what the bad news is: most of the time, when you get rid of that person, somebody else gets nominated into that space. So really, it's not about having those people at all to start with. And when you do have somebody who's underperforming, typically they're miscast. Right. They're in the wrong role. It's not that they're a terrible person. They're being asked to do something that's outside of their range of capability. Right. So what? what so on that note, then, what, I mean, what's your thought around what's the responsibility of the person? 
who's miscast, right? They're, they're not excelling in a role. They, you know, they're an animator and they've been put into a tech artist role and they're not doing well in the tech artist role and they keep not doing well in that role. Well, the best thing that they can do is try to figure out how to get out of it as quickly as possible uh, before somebody gets them out of it. Right. Because if somebody has to get them out of it, typically the outcome of that is not ideal. Right. Right? You're better off coming to your boss and saying, look, I'm not succeeding. I'm better at this other thing than the thing you're asking me to do. I'm not, I'm not working out. Then waiting for him to tell him or her to tell you that. Because if they have to tell you that, they've already kind of moved to another stage of the conversation. So always better. Now, if you're trying your best and you just go, hey, I don't have an aptitude for this, better to be upfront about it. We'd rather hear about it early and often than later. Because in the end, we're responsible for getting the whole thing done. Right. Which means that uh, when we have to, we're going to be ruthless about that. So here's, here's something I, along those lines that I wanted to ask you, because I actually have conversations with people about this, and, and uh, people tend to be fairly polarized on this. Do you believe that any single person has the aptitude for greatness? Sure, it's just what axis. Okay. Um, they can be the greatest slacker in Austin. That's <laughs> actually really fair. That's actually, there's a movie for that. So yeah, and, and the reason I ask is, is, is I'll have this discussion with people, right? I, I, I have this opinion that says any person can be amazing for the thing they're going after, to, within reason, right? I'm not going to be an NBA All-Star. Let's just face it. I, that's not going to happen at this, at this point. Maybe younger? No. Not going to happen. But if somebody... So, so I'll talk to people and I'll say, look, I believe this person who's got uh, you know, basic skills and whatever, say it's, it's a leadership, QA leadership, and, and I think this person can get there and be an amazing manager and go all the way up the chain in any industry. And I'll talk to other people and they'll say, you know what, I don't think people have capacity. I think everybody kind of hits a limit at a certain point, and once they hit that limit, there's nothing you can do to make them better. Uh, I don't see what I think it's most people stop themselves. Okay. You know, so it's self-limiting. Right. Not anything else. They, they have a story in their head, and the story in their head is, I'm only good enough to get here. Or, I can't be that because I was told sometime when I was seven... I couldn't be that, or, you know, I made up that story when I was 12, that I couldn't do it, right? Most of our limitations are completely self-governed. They're not external, they're actually internal, where we're going, I can't do, you know, you know, you can just listen to people and they say, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, and I'm going like, who said that? You know, I didn't say that, you said that. And if you say, you're going to make it true. You're going you're gonna to self-reinforce to go, I'm right because I said that. I'm going to prove I'm right by never doing it, ever. It's a self-sabotage kind of thing. And the reason I ask is because, you know, when we look at running companies and building teams, it's one of the things we run into. And at the end of the day, it's the same net effect, right? It's either people have an inbuilt capacity across a certain axis, uh, or they're self-limiting and sabotaging themselves. But the net effect is the same. But that kind of feeds in, for me, it feeds into that teachability side of things. You know, someone may have skills, they may have aptitude, but that teachability isn't just about taking external input, it's also what they're willing to do with it, and whether they're going to limit themselves or say, oh, no, I can't, or, oh, it's hard, or whatever. I'm always shocked in our business. So our business moves so fast, you know, it's changing all the time, and I'm shocked at the number of people who don't even study the business itself or their own their own skill. Right. right? If, I'm, if I'm, no matter what my primary skill is in the business, it's evolving while we're sitting here, right this moment. And the people who are kind of like get stuck in a rut and they say, I'm doing it the way this company does it. I'm gonna, as long as I do it the way this company does it, I'm going to be awesome. And are not looking to improve their skills uh, scare me a little bit because they're cruising for a bruising. Right. You know, right. The longer you stay with a company, the more likely you are to be more out of touch with where the market is. Because companies suck. Companies, you know, are lazy and dumb because they're run by groups of people, not by even individual people. So they don't, right. and they're not looking out for you. They're not looking out for the employees. They're looking out to get stuff done. When I hire somebody, I, see, you're in a, uh, what I like about your business is that you're hiring and that you're trying to say, okay, these people are going to be with me over a whole series of projects. It's been years since I've done that. I'm typically, I'm hiring for a project. Right. I have a particular construct that I have to build. It needs a certain group of talents put together in a certain way. And I need every person to be super functional in their part of that 
is that thing, and I'm not actually developing them for the next gig, right? I'm t optimizing for the current gig, and and so and that's how companies work. Companies aren't thinking about you; they're thinking about the current gig. Yeah, I mean, companies aren't <laughs> companies aren't people, right? Companies are soulless shells that contain people that are not soulless shells. So your company doesn't have your current job; it doesn't have your next job. People that you have relationships have your current job and your next job. And that's something that's kind of important to remember. When I first got out of uh, uh, college, I, I worked for IBM and doing uh, AIX mainframe, and OS2 work development, and this kind of stuff. And when I got the offer out of college, I was sure that I had arrived. I was sure that I was, I was going to die there. And uh, I got into week two, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to, I have to leave as soon as I can. I just can't help. And it's not to disparage that company at the time, and, and, and this is pre Gerson and a lot of the innovation that came along, and them shunting some of the, the, the wafer fab and some other stuff, and some decisions they made that, that really turned into a services organization. And this was all kind of just right, right before that. Um, and, and the difference was, is I was this passionate person who wanted to absorb and learn a bunch of stuff, and I was in a in kind of a localized environment that didn't support that. Um, and you, you have to find that, whether it's, it's things like this, you know, doing meetups, or whether it's pockets within your company, and then hopefully you grow those pockets so it's the whole company, because otherwise you create islands of isolation, and that, that's not good either. I mean, honestly, if you're not, to Gordon's point earlier, you raising the water all around or it's just not going to be a great scenario for you to go in day in and day out if you're like, you know what, I, I, I like the work I'm working on and I like three people there, um, but uh, that's kind of it. That, that just, that's not good. That's not good enough. That's not good. So, and I, I don't want to leave the impression that I don't work on the people that I work with, because I do. Right. But in the end, I'm not really, you know, I'm not really even empowered to work on their long-term career. Right. Right? What I'm empowered on is, can I leave them different than I found them? That's pretty yeah. much what I work on. Scarred, you know, crippled, whatever. You know, but I think I'm different than I've had one way or the other. They play positively <laughs> scarred, right? I think it's a tough I want to put some calluses on them in the right places so they won't get the blisters in the future. Well, I mean, honestly, you know, hopefully, you know, how, how many people have gone through, um, you know, rough situations throughout their, their job? Uh, history, just real quick. Yeah, who's oh, like, Ooh, that's a, yeah okay, okay, all right. So, so this is uh, this is the lead-up question for what I really want to ask. So, how how many were able to parlay that into something better moving forward? How many learned something from that? Was it, okay. So, we have a whole bunch of people who are, you know, I would argue, better people because of the stuff you go through. Now, that doesn't justify bad behavior or abuse or, or uh, you know, yeah, yeah, evil in the world. Me. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, uh, I know people whose attitude is, I, yeah, I'm, I know I'm being a jerk, but it's because I'm making them better. That's not, that's... It's tough love. It's, uh, it's, 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 acknowledge the, uh, tough love thing. Yeah. So, go, go ahead. No, I, I think it's, I think it's awesome, you know, when you think about it. So, life is actually pretty perfect. It, it's just hard to notice it most of the time. Because you can't, you don't know what's going to come out of what goes wrong today. Because when stuff goes wrong, you're going like, oh man, I'm in the world of, I'm in a world of hurt. This is crap. I can't believe it. But in fact, most of the time, you survive it, and you come out of it, and you end up in a better place. And you couldn't have got there without going through it. You'd yeah. still be stuck in that same place if it hadn't have blown up and been something like that. Right. right well, there, and there's, there's, you know, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an empathy that it builds for people who go through the, the same thing. And again, um, I'm talking about a uh, positive version of that, not, you know, I've seen companies do solidarity crunch, which is just stupid. Um, but I'm talking in empathy when no, you... No, but, uh, but embracing the stupidity lets you know not to do that. Well, yeah, it yeah. It helps you select, you know, right. when you go in and, and you start interviewing a company, you go, oh, this company's DNA is messed up. Right, yeah. I should not take the job when they offer it. That's, that's, Even though I need one today, I should not take a job with these people because they're idiots. That, that's a, that's a <laughs> really good point. point. It, it is, because <laughs> honestly, I, I, you know, I... I Back when I worked in the payments industry, I had the, the most uh, amazing boss I think I've ever had, John. And the guy taught me so much about how to be a, a good manager and a good leader and all this other stuff. And I had these conceptual ideas around what bad managers or bad leaders uh, look like until I worked for several of them and got very concrete examples of what not to do. Before it was theoretical. It's like, oh, of course I won't do blah, 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 blah. Then I got to see what it actually looked like and the slippery slope and things like that. Um, that there's some really important information in that, right? If you have gone through stuff that you don't like, don't do that. Don't do that to other people. Um, there's, there's learnings there that are actions that you can't just ignore and then move on from. Uh, there, there's a responsibility there to do something with those learnings and those those positive scars, those no, 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 calluses there's, in the right place. There's a lot of value in scar tissue. Right. You know, most people learn by touching the stove. 
<laughs> that's the uh, name of the street entry is touching the stove. Sizzle, sizzle. Uh, so, um, and, and, and you know, how many people here work for small or independent um, studios? Yeah. All right, good deal. How many work for large uh, publishers or larger devs? Okay. So there's a whole bunch of people that didn't answer. So it's like, I, you know, any in between? So independent is kind of interesting. Uh, and we'll catch up with some of you afterwards. I'm curious now. So. Uh, but, but, you know, indie is, is interesting because uh, independent just means, traditionally, independent of a publisher, right? And, and, and that's anything from the, the one or two people doing their projects and, and quality content at home to, you know, 300 strong studios on the East Coast or in Canada that are independent developers not owned by a publisher. Uh, but the new indie movement in games, uh, you know, I'm curious about this with you, Gordon, because you guys are independent. Um, yeah, and more Right, right, and so one of the things I've noticed with India the Independent is it's it's become this uh, this fracturing thing. Some people are very very proud of you know, I'm indie, uh, and then I'll say you know I'm an IGDA member, and they'll be like, oh well, we're not we're indie. I'm like I'm also indie and an IGDA member because IGDA supports game developers, um, so I kind of want to support the thing that supports game developers. Um, have you seen kind of a a, a a fracturing or a classism thing happening with the indie movement? I think it's just the the palettes get bigger. Right. You know, so the, some of the indie, you know, the people who call themselves indie are very adamantly non-commercial. Like, right. if they made money, they'd spit on it. <laughs> you know, that's not they, true. Well, at least that's what they say. But right. I think most of them grasp it uh, and you know, be like Smog the Dragon sitting on top of it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but, but that's because they're people. It's not because they're indie. Right. People always have really high ideals until they get the cash. That's uh, my experience. So, I, I think that, you know, we just have a broader palette. So many people can make games now. Right. It used to be you had to have a very esoteric set of skills and basically be unemployable elsewhere to make games. So, <laughs> you know, but now, you know, most of, you know, you can, you can use these skills, you know, they're transferable skills. If, if you can adapt your mindset to it. Right. So I think that we just have a big palette of devices we can make games on. We have a big palette of types of games that can get made. We have a big palette of ways that we can get paid to make games, or not, as the case may be. Right? So I think that, you know, it's, we live in a very interesting time for games. Because, you know, when I started making games, there might have been, you know, somewhere south of 8,000 people in the whole country making games. Right? right? Today, there's hundreds of thousands of people who make games. Hundreds of thousands, not like literally making games. That's what they do day in and day out, whether they're getting paid for it or not. Yeah, and that uh, to, to what you were saying about the uh, being able to adapt to new skills and things like that. We're talking about a little earlier people who get kind of um, uh, set in their ways. And there, there are some. There's there's a couple kinds of seniority, right, in any industry, right? There's seniority in the time you spent in the industry. And there's seniority in skills and expertise and, and professionalism and, and some other things. Uh, and one does not equal the other. Uh, I don't know how many people saw this. As we were looking at the console transition going into PS4 and Xbox One, we found a bunch of people across all disciplines who could not adapt. They had not kept their skills current for the current generation, which is now the last generation. Uh, and they, they were not capable of doing what was needed for the bigger horsepower and the different pipelines for the next generation of consoles. Um, that was a, a, for a guy that likes to grow people and see people grow, that was a very sobering thing for me to see. Uh, but I've also seen uh, just a, a very aggressive evolution uh, in, in specialization across different disciplines. So for example, um, it used to be you didn't have to go past fourth grade, then you had, you had to at least go to eighth grade, then you had to at least do high school, then you know, college is optional, then it's not. Uh, and, and I'm seeing a higher and higher bar for what's expected for people across all disciplines. You know, artists used to be able to more specialize in an area. Right now, artists need to be able to do multiple things, including what was used to be considered lightweight tech art. They need to know Python and Mel and, and be able to switch between Maya and, and uh, Max and, and things like that. Uh, and that's getting to be very, very normal for what expectations are, especially as you have these you know, indie movements that happen and people are, are uh, you know, people sharing across multiple companies and projects and that kind of thing, which is a Pretty cool thing in the indie scene that we like quite a bit and, and leverage. Um, but have you seen that? Have you seen people needing to be more specialized than they used to be, uh, and, and both well, broader and deeper? Well, I think it's on both uh, spectrums, right? If you work for the larger the company you work for, the deeper and narrower your specialization is. 
because you're a piece of a machine, right? Right. And that, and that piece needs to be perfect. Yeah. It's like a piece of a Swiss, Swiss watch. It has to be, you know, like letter perfect in what it's doing and be able to mesh well with all the other pieces. The lower down in the chain you go to smaller and smaller games, the more you need to be the jack of all trades. Right. You got to do everything. You got to pick up every single missing piece and put it back together. So you're better off being okay at a whole bunch of things than super awesome at one thing. So that, again, the broader palette lets different kinds of people go different ways. But the very first thing we were talking about, I think, is the key thing. So many people try to plateau in our business. They say, I'm really good at this. I'm so super awesome. I'm a COBOL programmer. COBOL is so awesome. And I'm going to program COBOL till the day I die. And then they come along, wait, there's no jobs in COBOL anymore. But am I a programmer or am I a COBOL programmer? Which am I? Right? Are you still willing to learn? Are you only there to, to coast? And if you're there to coast, you're going to have a lot of problems in our business. Just a lot. Because the business doesn't stay still. The, what the players want doesn't stay still. What the platforms are don't stay still. The state of the art doesn't stay Nothing stays still. Everything is moving. I like to think that we're basically trying to build stuff on the sand as the tide's going in and out. You know, if you've ever stood there, you know if you just stand there, you sink. That's what happens if you stand at the edge of the tide. You just sink into the sand. You can't stand there, you have to move. If you walk along it, you don't sink. If you stop, you sink. And that's what our business is. You're like a shark, you better not stop moving or you'll stop breathing. That's the way it works. Yeah, and I mean, just, just think about the innovations we've had in, in the game industry from you know, adding uh, mobile and tablet and how those markets have changed and premium models. And no, there's not just one premium model, there's like 27. And, and, and all of these things that change over time or, you know, virtual reality and, and you know, how, how it made multiple runs at it in like 79 and 84 and 91 and 2001 and, and again now. And now. And, and, and uh, just the, all of this innovation that's happened, right? And, and there's innovation and there's fragmentation at the same time there's innovation. And, uh, and, and then it's, it's not just about getting the thing done. Right, you know, say say if it were as easy as having an excellent engineer, an excellent artist, an excellent designer um, making a game, boy, our lives would be simple. We're making product. Product needs a consumer. Consumers need to purchase the product, uh, and it's it's an ecosystem that needs the whole round circle. Uh, or you're not making a product, and you're not a professional. You're an auteur, and you're doing art for art's sake. Uh, and th those are those are. Challenging problems to solve, honestly. When you're looking at, at um, you know, building a team and then people who have amazing ideas and tremendous vision for their games, and they can't figure out why the thing never gets done, and they just haven't thought through, and they they've tried. It's it's not for lack of trying, and it's not lack from lack of, of uh, intelligence at all. It's just they're they're thinking of things along a different axis, right? Whether it's the engineering problem or the smart people with their own worst enemy. Right. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. This, Every smart person just gets themselves in a crap load of trouble, from my experience. Yeah, well, that's, that's one of my other biases, right? You know, they're, they're intelligent people are not necessarily smart, right? Intelligence is a gift. Thinking is a skill that you better practice. Uh, action has to come from that thinking. Uh, and then you have, you have to exercise some sort of intuition, knowing when to act, when not to act. And all of those things together equal smart. And so I've seen some really, really intelligent people myself included, and I don't know that I'm that intelligent, but pretend I'm somewhat intelligent, uh, be really dumb. I am a bonehead sometimes. Well, the more action-oriented you are, the more you know, you're right. going to do it with vigor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's fire-ready aim. Dumb yeah. or good, doesn't matter. You're still going to do a lot of it. And that's, that, that's where it goes back to the accountability thing. It's when you surround yourself with people who know your weaknesses. And honestly, strength and weaknesses are, are, are often the same thing for all of us, right? I mean, one of my strengths is I, I don't care what people think of me. I honestly don't. It, it, I, I believe I have value because who I am as a creative person and the stuff I do is important because I need to be showing that. I have a, a, an obligation. My weakness is I don't care what people think of me. And if I'm not careful, I steamroll people, I miss people giving me their opinions, I don't take input, uh, I can come off as being cold or callous. Uh, and those are things I know about me on the strengths and weakness side. And that's just one of like my billion things. And so I surround myself with people who help me with that in an actionable, painful, constant way. And deep inside, you know you cherish them about yourself too. Actually, I'm loved that so much about me. I'm a special. I'm a snowflake. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if you, there, if, if you were to pick like one dumb idea that you've run into in the, in the game industry, 
uh, or in life. Well, it's not limited to the game industry. Um, what, what's the one dumb idea that you run into over and over and over again? So I have to pick from the whole mountain of dumb ideas. <laughs> a bunch. I don't hear a bunch. I mean, there's a mountain of dumbass ideas. Um, gosh, almighty. Um, first one's easy, easy enough, particularly if you work for publishers. So publishers treat you as a replaceable meat puppet. You know, you're, and your dev team is a replaceable meat puppet dev team. Because they say, you guys are a commodity, because they have to treat you that way in order to have the negotiating power. They have to say, well, if you don't do it, we have five other teams that will do it. who are just as good as you and probably cheaper. In fact, you know, they're not actually looking for a cohesive team to do the deal. They're looking for who can we find who will do it cheaper and listen to what we say better than anything else. And, and, and that's such a great way to get creative product out I don't know why they do, why, why why they would ever give it up, frankly. Well, and given that, the track record of ninety five percent of everything failing. Well, and that, that's you know, and that, that's actually a good point. And the publisher model, we didn't really get into it. It was one of the things I was curious about because the publisher model is changing quite a bit. And that traditional publisher model of, and, and not to say that all publishers do this, right? But, but you know, pretend that there's some truth to the stereotype of the usury model and, and publishers turning and burning developers. And then there's you know, as the, the the landscape changes. You end up with all these smaller independent studios, you have premium and all these other things coming in. There are a lot of publishers that are changing their models. Then there are some that don't. And I think that's independent of where the technology is or, or you know, where the, the, the market is or really whether they're a publisher or not. I think it's that consensus there's, of people. There's another the cycle that goes on. The cycle is external versus internal. Right, right. And, and yeah. all, all publishers go through that. Right. They, they go outside for a while, then they bring the people they like inside, and then they realize the people inside don't do what they tell them, so they go back outside again. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then, well, yeah, and then there's the, the financial side of that, where they purchase a whole bunch of studios that are working with so that they can minimize costs, and then over time those people become internal employees for a big media company, become expensive, and then for cost cutting reasons they, they cut those. Which is again where it goes to, your companies don't have your current job or your next job, people have your current job and your next job. Um, and there, you know, and there, there are publishers and media companies that are changing. It's kind of refreshing, right? Some of them are moving, you know, at, at the very least, they're moving to a distribution type model where it's not a publishing model. They give you money toward marketing and manufacture and distribution and some of that stuff as opposed to development. Uh, and then they, the onus is on uh, developers to kind of figure out what's that best model of, you know, work for hire versus cost offset versus back end revenue share and guarantees and all that stuff. And that's getting all sorts of money as, as things change. But also exciting because there's some neat players coming into the space just like there are there's a lot more happening on the development side there's a lot more happening on the publishing and investment and, and other side also uh, that we've seen which is pretty exciting so you still need the whole ecosystem and right that's the thing that developers often miss is they think a good game is not only um, necessary it's sufficient and in fact a good game is just one piece of one piece of the puzzle you got to have all the other parts you know it's like a multi-legged stool, and if you chop off the marketing and positioning, poof, leg of the stool, guess what? You can't sit on it. It's going to fall over with you on it. Right. You know, if, if you think you can get away without all that other stuff, you're just fooling yourself. Because once in a blue moon, somebody will, or appear to. It's more like they tend to appear to they got away with right. something. Uh, like every once in a while, you'll see a shitty game do really, really well. And you go, you know, play the game, you go, how did this game do so well? That's crazy, and then you'll think, well, the people on the marketing side will think, oh, look, we can take we can take our marketing, and we can make a shitty game into a great game. But no, it's just a it's an anomalous happening, and it happens in every, you know, about once or twice a year, one of these weird things happen, and everybody looks at it and goes, that proves my point, <laughs> right? When no, you have to look at all the data. You look at all the data, and you go, yeah, those things don't work because they're not well balanced, right? Or yeah. they're just crap. Well, and, and, then, and then there's the flip side of that, right? Where, where the external viewers don't see what went into that, right? Uh, I've been part of uh, some projects where they, the total budget was $200,000. Um, concept to sh shell, physical product, was six months. Uh, and they did it, right? And, and I mean, it, it, it's an amazing thing to get something through a pipe and physical product, console. Um, and, you know, the end product is, you know, Let's call it mediocre. People don't know the challenges that went into there. They don't know the budget wasn't adequate. They don't know the timeline wasn't adequate. And that's kind of what I was saying before. Care. And they don't care, right? They're the consumer. So they vote with their dollars. 
Uh, and that, that's where the, the, the picking the projects you work on, doing quality work, and nobody caring what you've done before, what you last did, is so important. Honestly. Unless it's your first job. Right. There's a whole bunch of yeah, things. You take your first job, just take the Do job. a really bad job. And, no, uh, no, no, you need to get that first job. Yeah. Because then yep. you're on the inside rather than on the outside. Yeah, and you get to you see. You can be as picky. Yeah. And, I, and that's a good point. You know, um, gamers who become game developers, I, I, I always hope they say both, right? Um, but I hope gamers who become game developers have a whole new appreciation for the work and the insanity and the challenges that go into making a creative product. But it's also, you know, I, I play all of the games we make, and I don't play them because they're from my studio. Uh, I really enjoy all of the, the finalized consumer versions of the things we had to hand in, and, and that's really neat and it's exciting for me. It's also, though, to your point, we're really careful about the stuff we take and the stuff we don't. We turn down a lot, a lot of projects. Because if it's not going to be quality, or if the people we work with are not caliber human beings, we turn down projects. Uh, and it's a, and that has to be me doing that, so I have to be really dicey and do all sorts of dancing. Uh, because I, I don't want to damage relationships, but I'm not going to paint ourselves with the same brush. Our reputation is everything we have in an industry. And so if I call around and check, people say, yeah, you don't want to work with so-and-so, uh, just because he's not an ethical person and he chooses not to work with ethical people, I'm not going to work with that person. That, that, and that's a scary thing as a developer, uh, as an indie developer, because yeah, it might need the work. Might need the work, and we've turned work down before that we need it because of our reputation, uh, and that's important to us. Uh, scary, but we do it. Yeah. Right. I think it's question time. Yeah. Where's our bike? Yeah. Somebody's just slacking here. Mike's not ready. It's because he was in rapt attention to to your, your work. I thought he got his. Well, I thought maybe he'd have like. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! We have other options here. Sorry about that. It's a little soft. Yeah. I thought maybe you'd have other dumb ideas. But you have plenty of that. Somebody yeah. will bring up a good dumb idea. Yeah. Okay. I think mean, while you're getting the mic to somebody, uh, so go ahead and, and uh, walk the mic over to someone. I mean, one of my big dumb ideas that's outside of games <coughs> is that, that that whole myth of uh, of independence. We are not independent. I'm sorry. We are dependent creatures that eat each other because if I could do everything in the world by myself, then this would be a different world. So for me, that's one of the things I run into all the time. People who think they can do things on their own, the, 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 uh, the lone wolf and the wolf pack of one, uh, that just doesn't work. I'm sorry. And, and I winnow out people from being candidates in our studio for that kind of mentality because it just it doesn't work. You can't do it all on your own. Uh, if you can and you like to do that, go do it on your own. That's oh, fine. They're legends in their own minds. It's uh, that that would be part of the that's the corollary to my big dumb idea is the uh, the egoist. All right. What's going on, guys? Hey. Um, you took notes. Like, this like, is not good. He's got like pages. This, this is, is not good. For us. <laughs> All right. Don't ask your question. All right. All right. So Adam, you you actually brought this up uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, what are some game industry habits? Uh, such as uh, unpaid internships, you know, kind of other ways of, you know, quote unquote, going through what everyone else go through, uh, everyone else went through. That doesn't exist anymore. What what kind of industry habits are bad ideas that need to stop? Oh, <laughs> so many. Most of them are so human that you'll never stop them. Right. So so people are idiots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so stuff is going to happen that looks very idiotic. And it doesn't mean, and I don't mean like just the people coming in, I mean the people on top. Right. Everybody's an idiot, really, deep down inside. It's just you have momentary, you know, glimpses of confidence from time to time. But most of the time, you know, you're, you're going through life and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to do dumb stuff. And you're going to do stuff because people did it to you. You know what I mean? Like, you go, okay, that's a pattern. I remember that pattern. I remember feeling somewhat successful when I did that pattern, even though it didn't work out very well in the end. That's how really dumb things happen all the time. Because the people are just, you know, accustomed to patterns which are stupid. Expressional words. <laughs> I mean, there, there is that. Going and actually, like, like I was mentioning with the, the, the good manager versus the bad managers I've had, when you have those negative examples, there's choice that comes out of that, right? There's, what am I going to do to not be that thing anymore? I mean, when I look at specific examples within the game industry, there are things like, um, you know, don't hire a person who is not a qualified person because you need a body. 
because if you're down at that point, now I'm speaking in idealistic versus pragmatic because there are times we have to make different choices. But honestly, we look at it and we say, you know what, we need a body and that person isn't qualified. We bring that person on, we're doing a disservice to them, to the company, to the client. So there's a lot of things we don't do there. Uh, crunch. Crunch for the sake of crunch. Uh, crunch because of bad planning. Crunch because your publisher said, hey, we're going to crunch, so we want you to crunch. Solidarity crunch. Just, it's dumb. And, and it doesn't need that to uh, happen. Um, the other thing, bless you. The other thing is taking care of people as people. Um, there's a, there, in some companies, not all companies, there, there's a tiering system for employees versus contractors. Uh, some of that, unfortunately, is, is legal stuff that people misunderstand about what they can and can't do for contingent staff versus uh, employed staff. And so they err on the side of making sure they're not treating contractors anywhere near the same as, as full-time people. Um, that creates a fracture in your company. And it's something that you have to work on constantly to make sure people understand why are there are some perks for some groups and not for others, and why there are there's, you know, California law that impacts you know, Texas uh, companies. And, well, that shouldn't be, but we don't live in an idealistic world, so we live in a realistic world. Um, things like that, you can do things about to improve your company culture. Um, and then it's also, there's levels of uh, transparency, which doesn't mean full transparency. You know, I'm, I'm a co-owner, I'm a GM, I'm running a company, I'm working through you know, dozens of, of pitches. In a week, I'm not going to share dozens of pitches with everybody at every level of the company every week. I do share the majority of them for the, the most likely scenarios, whether they're people are contract or full-time people. Um, but if I shared everything with everybody and all the stuff, I get disappointed all the time. I can take it. I have a few employees who can't, and they get depressed. If some neat thing comes down the pipe and was never a possibility, and then it got canceled, uh, and then they're like, oh, this studio just keeps spending. It's not failing. The thing was never an opportunity in the first place. It was great that we were even in the running. So, yep. Most people, you know, don't want don't want that. They don't want the you know the emotional ups and downs that go with all the crap that goes along with running a business because most of it looks very chaotic and scary. It you know it, it doesn't look like it. You know, people have very false ideas about everything that they haven't done before. Right. So when you haven't been married before, you have this idea about marriage, which is nothing like marriage. <laughs> when, you went to, when you went to high school, you had an idea about high school, which was not like high school. When you went to college, you had an idea about college. College wasn't like that. College was something else. When you work for a company and you have an idea about a company and then you go in it, 90% of the time you go, wow, this company is not what I thought it was going to be. You know, because you had an idealized view, not a realistic view of the thing. And running a business is just like that. Most people don't run businesses, so they have no idea what the, the their idealized view of a business and what actually happens are the difference between sausage and a slaughterhouse. That's what they, you know. It's just like making a game. Making a game is a slaughterhouse. Playing a game is like eating sausage. It's hot. It's juicy. If you're a carnivore, you love it. But if you had to make sausage, you'd be going, wow, that's a pretty nasty shit. That's not good. That's not good. There's bad things happening here when this gets made. It's not good. So anyone using this mic the way I'm holding it, like very close to my mouth, it's kind of quiet. So when you ask questions, keep that in mind. Uh, for companies that are about to launch a Kickstarter, uh, what do you recommend that they have um, support? Like, what are your sign that a company is ready to go for Kickstarter? Um, don't do it. Okay. No, <laughs> what happens? Uh, all right. So, signs that you're ready. Uh, have you aggregated a community that if 10% of them give you money, you'll make your number? That's, that's the first thing. You have to bring your own community to Kickstarter. Uh, is it really a, is it an idea worth kickstarting? Meaning, is it something that they can't get elsewhere? Is it different enough to where they can't get it elsewhere? Is it underserved? Meaning that they, you know, they're sitting around, they want this, but they can't get it elsewhere right now for some reason. That, that's, having the right idea for a Kickstarter is really, really important after you've aggregated a community. Because <coughs> you can't show up on Kickstarter and expect people to back you. It won't happen. There's no Kickstarter audience. There's a Kickstarter follow-on audience of maybe 20%. Meaning that if you had a Kickstarter and it's successful and you get featured, you'll get a 20% uptick. And every once in a while, some crazy thing happens and somebody gets 10,000% uptick, right? 
But you can't bet on that. You can never bet on that. The, when you go and look at games, or any games in particular, but when you look at almost everything on Kickstarter, typically they have an audience already prepared for whatever they're bringing. They have something that they can't get elsewhere. There's some uniqueness to it. And they're asking for the right amount of money for the right number of people. And if you don't make 25% of your money in the first three days, stop your Kickstarter, go back and rework it and figure it out again. Don't run a Kickstarter after the first three days if you didn't make 25% of the money. Because if you didn't, you're not going to make it. A bar in America. So you can go out and find a couple of Kickstarters that made it after making less than 25%. It's a couple against tens of thousands. That's the, you know, you can always find the exception to every rule. And, and unless you have some magic, you know, like a handful of magic beans that will make that happen, I would not bet on that. I'd figure out immediately, like I'm following a couple of Kickstarters now where they didn't make that rule and they're going to fail. And, it's, and it was obvious from day one to me, even before they got to day three, because they, they didn't define what they were doing clearly enough. You know, they didn't pre-create a community, and so now they're behind the eight ball. They're behind the power curve. And um, Kickstarter is a momentum activity. You have to get and maintain momentum. And if you don't, you got problems. So hopefully that's helpful. Probably not. Everybody has to touch the stove. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming here and your time. Uh, my question is more from your viewpoint as hiring managers, as people who have the uh, authority to hire people. Uh, say for example, uh, just for example, that you're coming from an industry that's not related to games, but for example, you work in marketing, communication, sales, PR, all that kind of stuff. Do you view a candidate like that as someone that brings like a kind of stigma of, oh well you don't really know what you're getting yourself into, uh, you don't have any experience in the game industry. And the quick follow-up is, if that is the case, what would you suggest to someone that just might happen to be in that situation uh, to do <laughs> so they could be more marketable for being hired in the game industry? Yeah, sure. So, um, so one of the things that I do is, is so, so the short answer is no, I don't. I, I, I look at people whether they're inside or outside the game industry. We hire a lot of people from outside the game industry. Even on the engineering side, we hire a lot of passionate uh, gamers from AMD, Intel Graphics Lab, National Instruments, and if any of them are here, I'm not going to say I'm sorry because I'm going to keep doing it. But um, <laughs> what I do want people to do is, is, is show me um, what they do and how it could apply to my particular needs or to the game industry in general, right? So, you know, if I see a good idea or good marketing campaigns or things like that, and I have, like, I, I have virtual clippings of, of all sorts of stuff I look at, and I'm like, you know what, I want to uh, apply this thing from financial services into my community management, or I want to take this thing over here from this uh, interstitial video ad campaign to um, some actually some in-game cutscenes or things like that. So I think those like, good ideas are good ideas, and you can see where the overlay is. Or someone like uh, your fanciful example, uh, you know, I, I think mapping it to something concrete helps. Uh, the other thing is, is be sensitive to whether we do or don't have the position, right? Um, one of the things that I'll do is I'll have people come in that will say, hey, you know, I'm a perfect fit for you and I'm going to do blah, blah, blah as, you know, the person who is uh, weaving your woven ceiling. I don't have a woven ceiling. I don't need you to weave my ceiling. Not sure what that is. Uh, but then when I politely say that and then give them some feedback on the portfolio of, of woven ceilings, they will then argue as to why I need a woven ceiling. And that doesn't help anybody, right? If I'm taking the time to try to make someone better and more marketable, even if I don't have the need, what you don't want to do is like push on what I'm doing to get additional stuff. I mean, it's fine to ask, and if I'm, I say, yeah, I don't have the time, I really apologize, um, then that's fine. Um, because I do try to, to meet with a lot, a lot of people outside the game industry, give them feedback, that kind of thing. We work really hard to respond to everybody who comes into our jobs alias and give them feedback. And we get really, and usually that's me. Uh, we get really, really behind, I get, I get behind. So I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm 12 candidates behind at this point. Uh, out of 228, that's not bad. But I, I feel bad about those 12 candidates, but that's my thing. My, my other co-founders are like, you realize you're the only one who knows you're 12 candidates behind. And me and in this room and the streaming audience and everyone. Um, but, but really for you, it's the, the take your skills, explain why they're applicable, and then you know, ask if whoever you're hitting up agrees and, and get some feedback as to how that could work. The other quick thing is if people tell me they're passionate about games, that, that, that 
that should be a good thing, and unfortunately it's become a negative trigger phrase for me right now, because a whole bunch of people don't have portfolios or don't articulate, they can't show me why they're passionate about games. Uh, you know, I had a guy who came in, and, and a great guy, and just one of those further conversation ceiling guys that was just not going to go anywhere, unfortunately. He was passionate about games, so I said, you know, hey, I, you're an engineer, what kind of work have you done to make uh, something for your portfolio? It's like, well, I've been kind of busy because I'm you know, in school and I'm working a, a, a job. I'm like, look, I got a candidate who's in school, working a job, dad just passed away, just had a baby, wife is sick, he's got four games that he's made in between all of this. That guy's passionate, and so that's your competition. And that's, to Gordon's point, you can always find the exception. Um, I got a lot of those kind of guys that want to work with us. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you got to show your passion. You, there's got to be some teeth there, honestly. Sorry, Gordon. Go ahead. Yeah, so you're starting at, a, you know, you're starting at the place where it's tough, right? You're transitioning industries. So whether you're, you were going to the advertising industry or you're going to the game industry or you're going to the nuclear power industry or whatever, with your particular skill set. So what do you have to overcome? You have to overcome knowing who the players are. You have to overcome knowing the, the lingo, right? The culture of the particular company. So you have a lot of you have a lot of barriers in your way. So the only way to overcome barriers like that is to be so super freaking exceptional at something that I'm gonna want to hire you no matter what. But you bring in me something that I can't get in my industry. You know, you have a, a set of expertise that you can demonstrate to me that says to me, wow, I should take a flyer on this guy and teach him what I know of his job that he should already know if I was hiring him at this level. Because he's going to bring something that those other guys that I can hire won't. So really, it's not about, you know, showing up for a job. It's showing up to, like, make a leverageable difference. Because that's what speaks to a business owner, is how are you going to take what I got and leverage me to a different point than I am today. That's the only thing that talks to me, other than, oh yeah, you're totally competent, you can do exactly what my current spurting artery problem is. I need compress bandages and tourniquets for every person I have. That's what their job is, is to go stop some set of bleeding for me. That is the only reason I hire anybody. I don't want to hire anybody, ever, again. Right? But every once in a while, I spring a leak somewhere, and somebody I have to get somebody to go over there and hold a bandage over that problem. And I want the best bandage holder I can find for that problem. That's a really good point, because a lot of times there, there's, there's a, a big, very important part of salesmanship in interviewing, and, and I don't want to discount that at all. But, and I do the same thing, it, it, in interviewing, you need to be finding out what your candidate company's problem is and how you can make their life better. And not in a, you know, squishy kind of, I want to make your life better. It's a, oh, I, I know how to fix that. I have a spurting art. What we do. So there may be things that we, we choose to do. We'd all like to release the perfect AAA game. There are realities of time, budget, and, and uh, technology limitations. You know, as, as a limited example, you know, say we're working on a title and, and we think for our platform, it's a multi skew property, it's gonna be on six platforms, and we know that we can get our platform to 60. Everybody's running down this road. If we get ours to 60, we can be better than everybody else. I'm like, okay, so here's the deal. You get to 60 on our platform, that causes the client problems with their other first-party relationships. So let me ask whether we could go to 60 and be the one platform going 60 hertz, or whether we're going to be capped to the lowest frame rate. We're going to be capped to the lowest frame rate. Uh, because they can't cause relational problems with the other first parties. It's frustrating. doesn't work well for me as an idealist, but it's reality. And so we have to listen to those kind of things. Um, you can add some other things like, well, the physical simulation actually falls apart if you go above uh, 30 hertz, so you got to think about that too. Um, but, but there are things outside of what we can be excited or passionate or feel like this has to get done. Uh, and that's important. That, that you got to understand that there's a bigger picture than just me, uh, and I deal with that all the time. Uh, on the flip side, there's the, you know, how do I affect change for, okay, I, I'm recognizing something that's potentially destructive in the company. You've got to talk to the people who are on the hook for that destructive change. You got to find out whether there's any avenue there or not, right? If you're talking to you know management that is responsible for that particular thing, there's no traction there. It's kind of a pearls before swine thing, and you got to think about that too. It might not do any good to to you know build people up uh, to change because a coup doesn't do any good if the guy on top is just going to get rid of the coup. Um, so you got to think about those kind of things also. Yeah. Last one. So uh, I hope you. Have... 
<laughs> I hope you'll forgive what might be a selfish question, but I think it can apply to anyone. Uh, say, for example, I apply to a job and the passion's there, I even know some of the people in the company, I've done everything that you uh, would I consider ideal for an applicant, but you still don't hear back. And time passes, a month, month and a half, whatever it may be more. What do you consider, I mean obviously within reason, not you know stalking people, but would you consider uh, contacting them again, maybe approaching your application from a different angle or uh, presenting some different facts or something as someone that's pushing uh, beyond the boundary of what an applicant should do, or do you, it, do you consider it someone that is just showing how passionate they are and that they just really want to you know, convey that they think they're good for the position? And for me, for our studio, it really depends. One, it, it's do we have a role open and available, right? If, if, if someone applies, uh, and again, we try to respond to everybody, and we, we miss some, and, and I know that. But if we don't have a position listed, whether I do or don't get back with someone, it doesn't necessarily make sense to follow up, right? You know, it, the, the, especially for smaller independent studios, we have set budgets. And so the creating a space within you know, our company for this new thing that we don't think that we need, that you want to convince us we need, is not a fundable thing, right? So that, that, that's kind of hard. If I've said, you know, there's not a position, and as a company and as a policy, we list our open positions and don't list um, positions we're not going to hire for, um, you got to honor that also. Uh, but, you know, if it's a position we've looked for, we've gotten passed on as a candidate, you know, I, I like people to get back with us, and a lot of times I'll tell people, I'm like, look, get back with me when, and usually it's not time-based, usually it's when you've done X, Y, and Z. I usually get feedback for the things I need to see. But regardless, when you get back to somebody, one, be upfront that you're getting back again. Say, you know, I've applied before, I uh, just wanted to update you on, here's the stuff I've done since I last submitted or since we last talked. Uh, there's a lot of people I meet at these kind of things who do that, and I appreciate it. And they, they, I'm up front with them whether we do or don't have a position, or whether it is or isn't a match. Uh, but I say what I want to see, and then I get updated portfolios. I get updated, hey, you know what, you were right, I need to look at C++, started this classwork. Obviously, it's still not there yet, but I'm a semester in, just wanted to let you know. Those are good, important things. It also lets me, as I'm looking around, saying, oh, I know a guy who needs a C++ intern, and, and he's a good mentor, so I'm going to introduce him to this guy. Um, so, you know, those kind of things are helpful. Just be concrete and be um, sincere. It, it's the not coming in as if you haven't applied before. I, you know, sometimes I'll get, uh, I get resumes where people have applied, you know, four times in three years. And I remember and they don't. And, and I'll, I'll, I won't say, hey, thanks for your interest in Panic Button. When I respond, I'll say, hey, thanks for your continued interest in Panic Button. Still not a match, but I appreciate uh, what you've done. Or I'll say, look, uh, I actually don't see anything different in the resume and portfolio than when you submitted in 2011. Can you talk about what you've done? And then usually don't hear anything back. Um, so th there's an onus on the candidate to, you know, that salesmanship side of things in an authentic way. Be honest, you know, I have applied before. Uh, don't be petty. You know, you didn't respond last time. Maybe you will this time. Uh, and hey, this is yeah, what I did. Really help. It really help. I got yeah. some of those too. That, that it's just a, to totally respond. But I, uh, I learned from Crayon Boy that uh, I do not engage <laughs> the crazy. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, scary and painful, and I take long lunches now just to avoid crazy people. Um, but uh, yeah, that's why I take long. But uh, 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 I sleep in my car and cry. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, just I, I recommend for us, you know, let us know these applied before. Um, you know, be respectful of our time. Uh, if it's still not a match, it's not a match. But I like to know that people are growing. I, I want people to grow. So I get excited, even if it's not a match. Somebody's like, hey, I did blah, blah, blah. Or I have people who have not taken a job with me, have taken jobs elsewhere, and they stay in touch with how they're growing at that new job. Uh, and they're not doing it in a, oh, look at me, Adam, you missed out. It's a, hey, you know, this is what I'm doing. I'm excited about this. I love that. I love that. And there's nothing. I just, I'm not going to poach them. And you know, they're not going to leave unless they're going to leave anyway. And then when they do, if there's a mutual match, great. Don't leave an interview without knowing when you're going to get followed up with and what the right curiosity is to follow up with afterwards. That's the key. If you actually get in the door, ask the damn questions, right? And then do what they say, right? Unless they're idiots and they say, oh, never get back to us and we might or might not get back to you. Then you can torture the crap out of them. Because you're probably not going to get the job anyway. So you might as well give them, give them a hard time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is after 9 o'clock. Thanks very much to our speakers tonight.
was basically their idea because they thought they could talk to each other for more than an hour and a half, and turns out they're right. Uh, you know, some, some uh, prompting from the audience. But uh, I thank everyone who found out about events that we do with IGD Austin. Please keep uh, tabs on AustinGameDevs.org, our Facebook page, our Meetup page. We're doing this stuff, so a little bit of insight will go a long way, and a lot of insight from people who have a lot to say will go even farther than that. So thank you, and uh, good luck to whatever it is you're doing. Yay. Cheers.